we would like to welcome Professor Andrei Okunko to the Quadrant Centennial KIAS lecture. I think the word that most accurately describes Professor Okunko's mathematics is the word disparate. That word appears four times in an, in an article of Simon's Foundation. One of them appears as follows. Mathematician Andre Okunko finds connections everywhere he goes with his extraordinary ability to bridge disparate fields. Interestingly, Okunko himself used the word disparate in his abstract for today's lecture like this. Modern high energy physics that equates seemingly disparate computations in two middle quantum field theories. So I'm sure his lecture today will be full of disparate ideas and surprises. Thank you. All right. So let me introduce uh, Professor Okunkov again. Uh, thank you. So Pro Professor Okunkov was born in 1969 in Moscow, maybe? in Russia, and he got his PhD from uh, Moscow State University under Professor Andrei Krylov and uh, Professor Oshanko, Oshan, Oshansky in 1995. And he has been uh, president of uh, Columbia University since uh, 2010. Also, he is a supervisor of HSE International Lab of Representation Theory and Mathematical Physics in Russia. And he has been appointed uh, previously in Princeton University, UC Berkeley, and UC University of Chicago. Uh, he has obtained the field medal in 2006, and also he became a fellow of American Academy of Arts and Science since uh, 2016. Uh, today, <laughs> Professor Okonkov will talk about surprises and applications of the three-dimensional mirror symmetry. Thank you. Thank you. So very much. It's uh, uh, it's such an honor for me to be giving these lectures, and I I wish wish maybe some some other some other festive occasion I'd be able to actually go and physically visit Kias. But uh, well, I'm I'm uh, I'm also very happy to be speaking from uh, the IPMU in, in Tokyo. It's uh, uh, we have still have colorful, very colorful glyphs here in, in Tokyo. Well, uh, this is, like I said, this is a very, very, um, very, uh, very nice occasion, the 25th anniversary of, of KIAS. But also a few days ago, we received uh, extremely tragic news uh, about uh, Professor Booms and Kim. Um, you know, so I apologize. Um, and and uh, who, uh, Really laid uh, many cornerstones to the building that uh, that the build, build uh, to the general building of a circle of ideas that will figure in the lectures, and uh, of course I want to dedicate what I'm going to say to his memory. And uh, I I literally use his constructions every day, and there's uh, and there's uh, much more for me to do to somehow fully realize the potential of his um, of his ideas and and his work. Uh, this is this is a picture of his on uh, which was a very happy occasion him receiving the Posca Prize. Um, anyway, that's extremely it's extremely, it's a, it's unspeakable tragedy, and uh, I understand everybody at Kiev is as struck by it as I am. Um, the story that I want to discuss today, like so many stories in the history of mathematics, uh, it has its roots in, in theoretical physics. And specifically in the study of uh, supersymmetric quantum field theories, um, of course, I'm uh, there's it's I, I'm not the person, and this is not the time to talk about in general what's a quantum field theory, but uh, but maybe uh, pictorial, I'll try to introduce it. So um, the quantum field theory is um, is uh, the theory that describes fluctuations of some some stuff, some matter fields, some gauge fields over both the space and time. And this could be, so usually have, uh, there's, a, um, there's a, a very important heuristic maybe symbol, this Feynman path integral, where you integrate over all possible realization of all possible fields over the whole space time, and you integrate with some weight, which is depends exponentially on some energy or some action of that field. 
And then depending on the, whether this uh, you take the constant in front of this action to be real or take it to be imaginary, then you, you make distinction between the quantum or statistical field theory. But in either situation, you see very, very, uh, so if you look microscopical, you see very um, violent and uh, beautiful fluctuations. When things are, you know, uh, things are born, uh, get you know, born and disappear, uh, and and it's clearly this is uh, this is uh, enormously complicated, enormously complicated system that contains, so it describes all the world around us, in particular ourselves. It contains all of contains of all of our math, in particular. So it's hard to it's hard to tackle this. So this we'll, we'll just look at some very small corner of it. But I was going to say that the, the point I was going to make to see this to see this fluctuation one is uh, one is uh, an actual atlas experiment and the other is uh, just simulation of Ising at the critical point. What one needs one needs of course very big machines. So one needs uh, the atlas experiment is a huge is a is a huge machine and electronic microscope is uh, so oh, sorry so. Uh, one needs some very very big machines to uh, to uh, to look at this to really access the tiny scales at which the fluctuations happen, or the great energies to excite the violent fluctuations. Well, if we look at our human scale, okay, so this is one is a picture of um, kind of high energy. On, on one side you see a high energy electron microscope, on the other side is the actual atlas. Um, whereas so. I apologize. Okay, well, maybe it's not so important. While at our human scale, even when the light, so, while on our human scale, this, uh, even when we see fluctuation, they're typically much more smooth and 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 well described by uh, by partial differential equations that uh, that uh, constitute the bulk of more classical mathematical physics. And so. Um, the uh, the relation in you know, one of the mysteries, of course, in in kind of mysteries and challenges in mathematical physics is to create is to connect the microscopic to the macroscopic, and the philosophical disconnection goes maybe I'll illustrate by this picture, which I uh, which I like very much, and I well, yes, I spent some years of my last of my life some years ago to think about it, thinking about it, and so if we see. Um, if we see a, a large, we want to describe a large scale behavior of a, of a system which, which fluctuates on a tiny atomic, some tiny atomic scale, what we can do is we can uh, choose a scale which is intermediate. You know, I don't know why, it's, sorry, I apologize, my computer is misbehaving. Maybe it reacts to my, reacts to my hands. So uh, we, uh, we, um, we can change. We, we can choose a scale which is intermediate between the macroscopic scale and uh, and the atomic scale, and so that that would be. So this means, from our perspective, this would be very small scale. But from the perspective of actual um, elementary particles or macroscopic fluctuation, that's a very very large scale. So on that intermediate scale. The behavior of a system should be as if it exists in an infinite space, and and also, of course, if we also would do the same, I I will, I, and maybe I won't say this every time, but uh, we can talk about uh, a statistical field theory takes takes place in 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 space, quantum field theory takes place in space time, and so that whatever when I refer to space, I should really. I very often should be really safe in space time. So this means should be in a, in a state which exists in infinite space time or an in infinite space in statistical mechanics. And that is <clears throat> such states are called different things in, um, in different branch of mathematical physics, but one of the name attached to them is a vacuum. Another name is a ground state. Another way, yet another name is a Gibbs state. And that's so. In other words, the 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 intuitive notion of a vacuum state or or um, or a Gibbs state or a, or or a ground state is a state that uh, in in an infinite space can exist for in, an infinite time, or in statistical situation just can exist in an infinite space. And uh, uh, vacuum. What I want to say that vacuum. Even think of vacuums. The word vacuum 
it, it doesn't mean there's nothing to it. So vacuum is not nothing. And maybe to illustrate this is uh, I <laughs> put three pictures. One of them, if I look at an empty screen, what I really, if I, if I examine an empty screen with a microscope, I see, of course, you know, something like, like this, a really a white screen looks like that. And then if I look at an empty piece of paper, a blank piece of paper, it also has a very, very complicated structure. Well, and finally, <laughs> we have a soup called she, it's a cabbage soup, and we call it empty when it has no meat in it, but it doesn't mean it's nothing. It just, it just, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's still, it's still some complicated structure. It's just, it just doesn't have any exciting stuff, any excitation, no meat. Uh, but the, the, the definition of the vacuum has some real meat to it. And so what the vacuum is, and so when we, when I wrote that, uh, when I wrote down that naive, when I wrote down that naive, uh, naive description of of um, of, uh, um, of what it means to you know what it means to uh, compute some average or expectation of some variable in in a quantum field theory, there is this path integral means you integrate over all integrate over all uh, configurations of all fields for all time uh, with respect with some with some weight which is given by an action. But then, of course, this is integration with respect to some fictitious measure d phi, which, which doesn't really exist in infinite dimensional space. And so uh, a vacuum state is, you can think of this as just really specification of this measure in infinite space. So this is not, there's no, there's no separate d phi, no separate density. You just have to, you have to, just, that measure needs to be specified, that state. And so maybe it's easy, slightly easier to explain in, in statistical situation. So then we, we ask for so suppose we have a, suppose we have a, a, a system just like you know just like we had before meaning so so just for me I didn't I didn't describe what the system was maybe I'll sorry apologies maybe I'll go back to this to the slide here so here where we what we see here so since I've since I've shown this slide so many times in my life I I, I guess I glossed over the actual description of what, what it says and so this is this is one of the simplest possible statistical system is is like a two-dimensional or means it's like an analog of random walk in two dimensions means instead of a instead of a curve making random up and down steps it's a it's a random surface that has three kinds of steps corresponding to three kinds of a unit cube and then you ask for for some for some random surface spanning a given boundary and then it has it's 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 an extremely simplistic model of a crystalline surface but it however shows some 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 interesting features like facet formation and so forth and so uh and so in particular so in other words it's like you look at at all possible pictures and we take them just equidistributed in this case uh all subject to the constraint that it is a surface composed out of three sides of the cube without overhangs and then um so to specify a measure really i need i need a measure of, of, of on all possible configurations of such things in an infinite so maybe you can talk about you can think about as a, as a tiling or plane by three kinds of rhombi or some other some other descriptions of that but anyway there's some random model and you need to specify a measure on the set of its configurations and what does it mean that the measure has to be kind of like have a density given uh, by some energy uh, Exp yeah, that decays expansion on energy, or in this case, it's just all equally, equally. In this case, it's just all equally, equally uh, likely subject to constraints. And so to say that, it means that if I condition my measure on what it does outside any given any finite region, then the in the middle it has to be the case that what I get to sample in the middle is is distributed according to the measure according to the. Uh, not sure what's happening here. Some, some. I hope it's not. I don't know why I get this. I guess you can ignore it. You click to join. Yeah, I think so. Like some. Okay. Oh well, no. Okay. Well, here. So um, Skype tries to be smarter than I. So uh, so then, which is easy, right? <laughs> so, so anyway, you, you look for a measure of in configuration such that on any any given window subject conditioned on what's happening outside is this 
changes it according to this, according to probability being decaying exponentially with energy with constant being one over the temperature, which was in this case equally likely. And uh, it could be a really hard problem to describe to describe the all sets of of um, of 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 such vacuum. And for example, for for this for this kind of problem, the problem was solved only very recently in the work of a, a, a very very bright mathematician called Amol Agarwal. So uh, could so you know it's, it could be a really hard problem to uh, I don't know why I have this line here. Maybe let me remove it. Not sure what this line means. I apologize. Let me try to. Why does it want to? I apologize. This is. Uh, I don't know why why Zoom wants to have this 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 thing on top of. Anyway, I apologize. So. Um, I have to scroll a little bit. So it could be a really hard problem to describe a set of all possible vacua. And since they come in continuous family, people just refer to them as moduli of vacua. And uh, coordinates, coordinates, it's very, to see, very easy to think what are the coordinates on the space of vacua. Well, the vacua are the all measures. So, you know, coordinates are just measurements of all possible quantities. So those are the coordinates. And then, but then the equations that exist between different measurements, those are the equations of state. Like for instance, if I if I are talking about uh, if I'm talking about the states of ideal gas or some gas which is close to the ideal gas, then then you can measure all sorts of things. But uh, but in fact, it's enough to measure the temperature, which is the mean kinetic energy of of molecules, and the density, which is well mean mean number of molecules per unit volume, and everything else will be determined by equations of state. And so then what we locally, this kind of, if we, you know, we locally expect these equations to be, uh, to have the form that, um, that we have the form that my set is given as a minimum of some function, function being the free energy. So this is very, for Gibbs state, this is a very well known theorem that the Gibbs states are minimum of some functional, uh, minimum of free energy per unit volume. And then, but then there may be some redundancy in this description. And so then I have to mod out by this redundancy called the gauge symmetries. And so this is, I, I was gonna say, to be very, very honest with you, there's some, some modular space of vacuum X, which I am gonna discuss below, they are not known to have such description in finite dimensional terms. So, I mean, you can write them as some infinite dimensional Quotients of that kind, but it's not known that they can be realized in this sense in fine dimensional terms. And so that is, that actually hampers a little bit of the analysis. So it'd be nice to know that it exists. But uh, anyway, carrying, carrying on, um, I wish I knew the origin of this yellow line on my screen, but it's uh, maybe it's best if I just ignore it. So, um, so then the extra structure, there's a, a Extra structure and constraints arise from symmetries in problem. In particular, if you have supersymmetries, which we'll abbreviate to SUSY, then uh, that puts extra structure typical in the tangent space to this my modular vacuum. And so in, in we will be interested in a situation when we have a lot of supersymmetry. And so in that case, X would be X would be not just some real real manifold, but in fact a complex algebraic variety. And, and, and in fact, wants to be with the extended supersymmetry that we want to consider, we will, we will want to be symplectic. Although you have to say what it means for symplectic means for if it, if this if you have a singular algebraic variety. And maybe to um, to give a, an example straight away. Um, so um, we will be interested in in quantum field theories in two plus one in two plus one dimensions. Um, and then, uh, and then we will have them with, with, with we'll have eight supercharges. And the situation X will wants to be like a hyperkeller manifold, but uh, in reality, so when we, when people talk about hyperkeller manifold, they usually mean uh, that's a smooth and compact, but it'll be neither smooth nor compact. So uh, usually, but I mean the typical example could be either either you take the quadric cone, which is x squared plus y squared equals z squared, which is a smooth, which is singular affine uh, algebraic variety, or maybe a related variety is obtained by blowing up the 
vertex of that cone, and that would be that would be. I apologize. This is somehow too sensitive. My display. So here, um, a related. So then, it's here. So a related manifold to this quadric cone is obtained by just blowing up the vertex of the cone. In which case, what you get, the the over the blow up, you get a projective line. And so, we, it's a, it is a complex projective line. But I won't be. I will. Every all algebraic varieties in this talk will be complex. So I will drop that complex. The C in what follows will just P1. And so then the cotangent bundle to and this and the whole thing would be the cotangent bundle to this complex P1. This is the this is really like the the unicellular algorithm. If you think of the fauna of all possible of all possible uh, mod vacuum modular space of vacuum this is generality this is maybe this is by far the simplest it's like like a unicellular argument and the way to put it in a larger context you one can note that uh, the quadric cone that is so it's a, it's a, it's a cone in a three dimensional space and in this three dimensional space one can interpret as the lie algebra of the simplest well, maybe not exactly the simplest, but simple, simple Lie algebra SL2. And that's in the condition that's a three dimensional algebra. And the condition to lie on a cone is the condition of being a nilpotent element there. And then this is very known that in general, the variety of nilpotent elements uh, in a Lie algebra, it's a very nice, it's a very nice um, uh, singular Poisson variety that is resolved by the end of you want is in general T star of the flag manifold, the start of T star of the group module, the Borel subgroup. It's called the Sprinkler resolution. And so this is um, this is uh, um, this is the. Um, so what if I click it? What, what's going to happen? So maybe. Okay. Then, oh, still is there. You know, so at least at least we got read, at least we got read out of out of, of one of one of this one of oh, the okay. annoying pop-ups. I don't know how to get rid of the out of the yellow oh, get rid of the yellow line. I guess the yellow line will just stay there. So uh so so anyway, so this is uh, uh so this is for every Lie algebra there is uh there is some there's some corresponding x which is uh you know depending on the context it's either the cone of the Important elements or the T star or its resolution, T star of the flag manifold, the corresponding Lie group. And awaiting, so this, since we don't have, I don't think we have uh, a good a good uh, classification or axiomatic description of all possible axes that can appear in this context. Maybe uh, at this awaiting such description, maybe one be content with the metaphors like those are like the Lie algebra of the 21st century. So again, it's not it's not a mathematical statement, but it's uh, maybe it's a good statement in terms of a, a, a guiding principle or how to think about it. Now going back to our um, now going back to our to what we to what we were uh, how we were connecting the microscopic with the macroscopic. Uh, so if we remember, I, I said if I have a, 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 a behavior at very large scales of um, let me wait till the zoom doesn't want to. Okay, here it's final here. So at large scales, I um, I'd like to describe my quantum system as um, so. As as uh, as a if you want to say a modulated vacuum means depending on the point, I can be so I can define myself in different in different vacuum vacuum state, and you can think of this as a as a weather map because we discuss how for a gas, the this the Gibbs states are described by two constants by the either the density and the temperature or the pressure and the temperature, those are connected by the, by the equation of state. And so if I, if I plot, if I plot the pressure and the temperature as, uh, as functions of the point on the earth, so it's, like it's what the typical weather map does, that is a map from the, from the space, which is space of the surface of the earth to the moduli of vacuum, which is the state of, of, uh, 
which is the state of the state of my fluctuating system. And so we, we in other words, somehow the key concept again. So if I if I look at the at the at the, the system of a large by finite size, then I can I can describe it by a map from from the space or the space time to uh, to the modular vacuum. So this is a modulated vacuum. And similarly, um, similarly like the state of vacuum is supposed to satisfy some variational principle. This also should satisfy variational principle and also and also some conservation laws. And so in other words, it'll satisfy PDEs, which are uh, which is which are the you know, the PDEs describing our what usually happens in our microscopic situation. And the what this in the situation of interstellar, so the main of that that PD will be say that the map is holomorphic. So will be there will be uh, the this would be we'll, this is why you know, the reason we will be studying holomorphic maps from a surface to a some modular space of vacuum is because we're interested in in a quantum field theory that lives in two spatial and one temporal dimension. And this and the holomorphic maps are the supersymmetric states. Those are the those are the states annihilated by a particular supersymmetry. So if I if I want to talk about this is this is the this is the this is the classical description of microscopic situation, but if I want to talk about fluctuations, that maybe one language to try is to to say that um, I'd like to describe I'd like to describe uh, so quantum field theory. Okay, quantum field theory is is again it's some fluctuations of not just over time but also over space. But I can uh, uh, describe this as a, maybe slightly metaphorical as a quantum mechanics on an infinite dimensional space. The space being all possible configuration of fields on my and on a given time slice. But what I'm, what I'm, uh, what this would amount to here is that I'd like to say that maybe, maybe I can describe the quantum dynamics in this, in this, in the setup as as an evolution, which is where the energy operator is the square of the Dirac operator, where Dirac operator lives on the moduli spaces of of maps. In this case, maybe all smooth maps or some kind of regular with some regularity maps uh, from my space to the modular vacuum X. And this is this is as <laughs> now this is this this is this is hard to make it more than a metaphor. This is extremely is really complicated to make serious math out of this, and this is not what I'm not what I'm will attempt to do. However. It, it this is this is in this very very complicated situation we still can have a well defined index or maybe I should say twisted index but okay we'll just we'll just drop the word twisted so which is the index uh, and uh, this is uh, people often call it Witten index and then uh, and then an amazing amazing property of the index why it's, uh, why why both mathematicians and physicists like it is that because index is um, is uh, invariant of continuous deformations. In particular, it's independent of I. 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 I we. I'm talking about this. I'm right now, we're talking about description of a system at very, very large length scales. But uh, but index being uh, invariant of continuous deformations, that in, then it's 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 therefore just generally an invariant deformation invariant of my quantum field theory. And what's what's an index? Index is uh, well, maybe this is this iconic picture here. Is that uh, suppose my evolution operator is a square of some operator like the rock operator that changes both on if I have my Hilbert space is a z two graded, and I have a z mod two graded, and then I have uh, so I have the even and the odd sector, the bosonic and fermionic sector. And then I have an operator that changes that parity and squares to my energy operator. Then, of course, at every energy level which is not zero, this will be an isomorphism between the eigenspace at the, the eigenspace, the bosonic eigenspace, and the fermionic eigenspace. Just my operator itself, since it squares to the identity on the given on the given eigenspace. So it will be an isomorphism between between the even and the odd part of a given eigenspace. And so if I compute the trace of, or maybe schematical, the kind of thing I want to compute like the trace 
uh, typically I want to compute the trace of minus exponential divided by some minus the energy divided by some constant t. But if I insert minus one to the number of fermions, so this is this that everything everything from the between the all the non-zero eigenvalues in the boson and fermions will cancel out, and I'll be left with just the with just the uh, was just the i zero eigenvalue. And the, and the and the index is defined as the even part of the kernel minus the odd part of the kernel or the kernel between the you know, and the co-kernel. So there's some this is maybe this one definition we're going to use. And um, and this thing is so. What does it mean? So maybe I'm sorry to me the big order. What does it mean to take uh, the difference between two vector spaces? So I take the even part of the kernel of the Dirac operator minus the odd part of the, it's a difference between two fine dimensional vector spaces. And I view it as, uh, or ideally fine dimensional, but we'll see. Uh, I view it as a virtual representation of all of all symmetries of the theory. So this is uh, not, not just interested in one operator, Dirac operator, I'm I'm interested in the action of all of all symmetries that there are, and the symmetries act as uh, as uh, automorphisms of my space X, and also auto, they also my space time itself can have automorphism. They also act there, and so 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 this is <coughs> and the difference. So if I have two representation of my group and I take the difference, this is by definition an element of what people call representation ring of the group. And this representation ring of the group, so where, where the, such expressions you can add, take direct sums, so you can also tensor multiply them, and so then so you get you get a ring. And so such expressions people call the 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 group equivalent k theory of a point, and they okay, while this fancy, slightly fancy terminology, it's well described by the following notion that in general, if I have a, a topological space. And uh, with an action of group of a group, usually people in topology take the group to be compact. You know, we can tell it. We we will be more 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 leaning towards the situation when I have an algebraic variety with an action of reductive group. But let's say if you want a classical algebraic topology, people take a topological space with an action of a compact group. Then uh, then you can take you can take uh, consider equivariant vector bundles over that space, meaning. It's an equivalent vector bundle. It's it's a vector bundle over my topological space. It's a it's a, it's a space which is which fibers in 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 vector spaces over my base space Y, and it's an equivalent if it has an action of a group which which covers the action on the base and acts by linear transformations in the fibers. So if I have a so it takes takes base base point to base. It takes points of the base to now, point of the base y to points of the base g y. Maybe I'll try to draw an arrow here, so maybe it takes a point here, there, and then then it also acts. It takes a while for the arrow to appear. Then uh, then it uh, then it acts fiber to the fiber. The transformation has to be linear. And so if if I take if I take such objects, I can add and tensor multiply them. And to, but to make a ring, I have to consider I have to allow differences between them. And so that would be that would be if I take difference of such such things, then um, then I'm gonna get a ring which is called the the, the which called the called equivalent case here. If if my and if my uh, if my uh, y is a point, then then I'm all all I'm talking about are just representations of a group. And so then I, my my equivalent k theory of a point that's just representation ring of this given group. And uh, so anyway, this index or this long, we will need we will need k theory in this talk. And in fact, we'll need it even more, which is why I spent so much time explaining what it is. I hope most of you are familiar with what it is, but it's if it's if if you aren't, then it's not such a complicated object and it's very useful. So uh, this index is, um, like I said, it's an element in the k theory of uh, of a point for all symmetries of the theory, which includes symmetries of x and also symmetries of the domain C. And so that we you know, somehow what we thus we meet our main hero. Our main hero is uh, I'd like to take 
So I have some curve C, which will be, uh, in fact, can vary in moduli. So this, this is important, but maybe not for these two lectures. And then I can, and I consider holomorphic maps from that curve C to my X. And then this is this is some this is some algebraic variety, which is uh, on which I have an action of of the automorphism group of X, and I also have an action of the automorphism group of C. And then on this algebra at this algebraic variety, it's not I mean how to say it? it's uh, it's not it's it's only if algebraic variety it's a countable union of algebraic varieties. It means if I fix the degree of this map. So this is then I then I get a finite dimensional algebraic variety. So if I again, again I get it's a count of uniform algebraic varieties. So that's a, each one rep, each, each one parameterizes holomorphic maps over a given degree from from my curve C to to X. And now on this, I'd like to compute the the index of the Dirac operator. The index of the Dirac operator is some, something which is easier to define than the than the Dirac operator itself, because <laughs> ever since ITI and Zinger, we know that the index of Dirac operator is some topological quantity, is some is some A roof genus, which should be which one can apply to Kabor class. It doesn't have to be a manifold to use a Kabordism class or something like that. Anyway, so this is some there's a purely topological way to assign the index of Dirac operator to to this to this manifold takes value it's 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 an it's uh, it's a representation it's a representation of all my automorphisms group but also in fact it's a, it's it it will form as the curve as the curve moves in families this would be also be a bundle over the modular of curves so it's an element in the k theory of the moduli of curves and or maybe say better say moduli stacks since we take in, into account the automorphisms of curves also and then, uh, which is also, which is also carries an action of the automorphism group of X. So that's that's the object that we would like to, would like to compute. And I should say that, of course, we, we, we're going to compute it in algebraic geometry. In algebraic geometry, it comes as Euler critics of some of some shift. It has also topological meaning, but computed will compute it in algebraic geometry. Well, so we this this is the main this this is the main uh huh. Oh, what is the index of she? What is she here? Index of she, she. She what? Ind she. Oh, what is she? Um, oh, she is a curve. Oh, she is curve. She is the, is the source. She is where it's my space. She is my space. I'm, I'm interested in two plus one spatial QC, the two plus one dimensions, and she is mm -hmm. my curve. And that's, uh, but that in principle, so I can take it for fixed curves, C, but it can also vary in module. It will be, maybe we'll, and so that's, that's the main thing that we want to study. And I should stress again that this is uh, a mathematical understanding of all the moduli spaces here and various structures that they cover, that they, uh, that they carry. This is, uh, this has been greatly advanced by, by the work of Boomsik and it's just, just, I'm just, I can just only repeat again that this is this unspeakable strategy that he is no longer with us. And so in particular, we will be uh, in the you know the situation that we will be uh, will be of main interest to us is is when X, like I said, X could be written X in general, we, we, we think that X we would like X to write as a critical locus of some function uh, modular. Uh, maybe a reductive group or a compact group or something like that and uh and then um and then the special case of that is uh is when the uh, functions has to do with real moment with with complex moment map and so then it's then it's called the algebraic symplectic reduction and and examples of such very important examples of such algebraic axis appear are the nakajima quiver varieties and uh and both both uh, this symplectic reduction situation and more general critical situation, 
there's a very, very important foundational work done by Boomsik and his collaborators, which, which is just crucial in mean, the constructions. The constructions, the, the actual moduli spaces one one uses here are the ones constructed by, by Boomsik Kim and his collaborators and, and constructed and studied and 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 the aspect of uh, many aspects of uh, of their geometry really clarified by Boomsik. So uh, I should say that uh, so in particular one of the one of his uh, last papers has to do with the with the notion of uh, cohomological field theories and this is also also will will not play some important role in this talk but will be it's a philosophical important notion is that if I uh, uh, in the full development of the theory one should allow also marked points and and nodes when nodes when it's like it's a, which something looks like x y equals zero locally, and so uh, and so at the marked point you can those are the points where you can remember we were in the end we want to we want to integrate some we want to kind of measure some observables in quantum field theories and so the marked points is where we can insert some operators, and uh, and then the nodes are the things where we glue over these so we think node you can take apart to get two marked points. And so then you glue over a complete set of operators there to get to get the theory with a node, and uh, and so this is in, and in fact so the construction above gives a case theory class on the whole moduli stack of nodal curves with marked points, and it forms um, a K theoretic analog of uh, homological field theory. That's a very important notion. Um, okay, maybe to reiterate, what is it we want to study? Is that we we study some index. But now this index is, uh, I uh, when I define the index of Dirac operator, I said, well, it's like a finite dimensional space, association of so finite dimensional virtual representation of subgroup. Uh, well, it's not exactly going to be the case here. This would be an infinite dimensional space and an infinite dimensional space for two reasons. One reason is is that, like I said, the, the moduli space of maps, it's, it's, it's a countable union of algebraic varieties. So, my my index would be will have will have a gradient with countably many graded components indexed by just the degree of the map. So it has the degree of the degree gradient. And also the space itself will be also infinite dimensional, which will have to do with the fact that x, the x, all the x's we we, we, we have they they never compact. So this. Uh, this uh, when we compute various other characteristics of, of shapes or various area of genera, they never they never actually find a dimension. However, you get an infinite dimensional representation whose trace uh, is a rational is is well defined as a rational function. That's that's um, that's a very uh, that's a kind of a rather general phenomenon in uh, in infinite dimensional representations of of groups that you can have. Um, like, like imagine imagine the situation and if I take uh, uh, some some fine some 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 finely generated algebra where the group acts on the set of generators then the, the then the then the uh, then the character of any finely generated module over the finely generated algebra will be uh, in fact will have even though it's if it's even though it can be infinite dimensional space but still its character will be a rational function so it will be somehow. So, in other words, with, out of this, so out of these two two things, we can we can construct we can finally construct something like a trace, and so then for that we have well the trace of each graded component is already well defined as a rational function, it's a rational function of the morphic group, and then we uh, to account for all possible degrees we introduce we introduce new variables let's call them z. And so it's in fact so it's degrees in principle a multi-index. So Z is in fact a bunch of a bi belongs to a certain torus, which the torus is the so the degree of the map takes uh, degree of the map takes values in h lower two of x with coefficients of Z. It's just the image of the fundamental class of the curve under the map. And then the dual group is h upper two. And so then uh, if I take the tensor with C star, I get a torus in which the variables Z live. And so this would be a torus. It's important to think about this torus as if it was uh, also maximal torus in some group. So it's a, so this is on the one side we compute we compute the character of a group, which is 
by conjugation of groups connected, then you can think if they can think of this as uh, as uh, a function on the maximal torus, and then uh, uh, and the, this the z variable that counts the degree, it's also very useful to think about as a function on on the maximal torus of some other group. So if we get a function of on on of all the symmetries plus new variable two star z, and uh, maybe I, I imagine you were you probably tired list to to me listening uh, to listening to me tell you about the definition of this object, and of, of course I've <laughs> spared you great many details. are very difficult to define, then even more difficult to compute. But still, it's it's much much easier than any other computation quantum field theory. So it's it's uh, it's, uh, it's good that you know, if, if we take things relative to other things, so this is much much easier. So. Um, and now, so we have this. Okay, we now with 45 minutes into the lecture, we we have the the objects about which we were going to contemplate. And and so this lecture is about supposed to be about three-dimensional mirror symmetry. And that's a whole bunch of physical. I mean, the whole bundle bunches. Not. I mean, it, it's really beautiful building maybe of uh, various physical and mathematical conjectures that uh, many, many people worked on. And it seems like, for example, at, uh, at Kabul IPV where I'm now, it seems like everybody's working on this. Uh, so, uh, but so I list here, I listed maybe four earliest references on this and then maybe there's millions after that. And uh, it's an amazing duality. It, it uh, has many features of Langland's duality. And which so fits well with what I said that this X being like the Lee algebra of the 21st century. But its basic numerical prediction, and here it is, is, is the existence of dual pairs of theories, X and X check, somehow mirroring the Langlands's, I mean, somehow you think of the Langlands dual theory, the dual pairs such that these indices are equal. However, the meaning of the variable is dramatically different. So what is the variable Z on one side? I told you that it's good to think of Z as being kind of like a maximal torus in some group. And that group is are the symplectic automorphisms of X check. So there's some, the, I have X check, which is a symplectic or Poisson algebraic variety. And then of, among all automorphisms, there are, those that preserve it, and but also they're one that scale it. So we, we just look at those that preserve it, preserve that structure. And so if you look at maximal torus in the, in the group of symplectic automorphism of the dual space, that is identified with Z and vice versa. So if I take make that change of variables, then these two functions are remarkably the same. So for instance, one side, in one side there was uh, by construction a rational function in, in, in the variables. And so if this is to be the case, that it has to be also the case that is with sum over all degrees, then the result is a rational function, which is, which is, which is, which is very surprising to say the least to, uh, to uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you, the first time you see it, because there's some, you know, <laughs> it's not, it, uh, it, for many other geometries, it's certainly not a rational function, and so. Um, but it is. It is. Uh, so this this rationality in is already uh, maybe the first the first surprise here. But anyway, so that's that is the that is the that is the particular numerical prediction that we will like to discuss. And at least for me, the motivating the motivating example here. Why this has to be the case is uh, is the theory that, that describes uh, what lives on the. <clears throat> remember, we 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 talked about this. These are theories of uh, this are about quantum field theories in two plus one dimension, and maybe an example, or maybe one of the most intriguing example of such quantum field theories is what's supposed to live. What's supposed to describe the fluctuation of the membrane in M theory? Now, okay, so I'm not I'm not a person to even speak about string theory, so let alone M theory, but uh, in the M theory is like the next step after string theory, where instead of where the space time is 11 dimensional, and instead of strings propagating, string is, um, string is a, you know, it is a string, and then so it's world volume, is uh, is world volume is, uh, 
is 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 a surface. Uh, so a membrane has a it's a it's a two plus one dimensional object. So it's world volume with a three manifold. And I tried my best to draw some three manifolds here to propagate a level dimensional space. This 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 want to be more or less embedded minimal surfaces, more or less. But they can, of course, they have uh, there's some other uh, there's some other actors in this story, but uh, there are many conjectures about it. But maybe the one I like the best is well, maybe at least at least in this constant is the one we made with Nikrasov uh, back in back back some time ago. I apologize. This is, I think if I if I lean too close to my computer to my uh, to my tablet, it reacts to. To, uh, to just my electric potential. So, uh, so this is if I take the so this I need an eleven dimensional reach of flat space, and that eleven dimensional reach of flat space I will take to be um, I will take to be uh, a Calabi L five, so uh, 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 an algebraic variety with variety one with the first turn class vanishing plus plus the time circle times the time circle so that makes 11 dimensions and then my uh my five fold i'll take to be a rank four vector bundle over my curve c but in fact that rank four vector bundle i will split in two and I'll take it to c2 plus c2 or maybe even secretly i would take it to be a sum of four line bundles but then i'll take the first two line bundles i name it blue c2 and the and the third and the fourth line bundle i named it I name it the bread C2. So I can achieve by making a suitable non trivial, I can achieve that the first turn class of this whole geometry vanishes. And now the membranes I'd like to see, well, they'd be kind of the, the membranes I'd like to introduce are, are we more or less be the, the zero section of this line bundle, except I'd like the zero section to have multiplicity M. So I have M membranes. As a physicist will say, wrapping my uh, my zero section, and as uh, as a special case of our more general connection conjecture, what one conjectures here is that the index, the contribution of this membrane, which is m times the zero section, so my membrane is m times the zero section of that of that uh, uh, rank four bundles over a curve. This contribution of the index is just this index. Which we're discussing, but for a particular geometry, you you consider maps from the curve C to the Hilbert scheme of point of n points on the blue C2. So a Hilbert scheme of points is an example of an echogen variety. So it's a case, it's an example of variety X that we consider here. And so this is this has this well well defined, well defined moduli space of What's technical called quasi maps and defined by Chakan, Fontanin, Kim, and Moller, and has that index that we want, and so that uh, uh, and then the and the only contribution you can ask you can ask what what about <laughs> where is the what's the role of the other what's the role of the red C two and the only role of the red C two is that the index of the membrane we're supposed to compute equivalently where where in particular I have an action of this matrix Z on the diagonal Z and Z inverse acting on the red city. And that's the only contribution, the only thing that, uh, the only thing that red city remembers is that this action. And then becomes that variable Z in, in so that becomes the variable Z in the index problem. So, okay, so this is, there is in this problem here, and here we have this z to the degree, and this z here is the same as the z here. Okay. So you think, well, how can this be possible? That since I, I took I took uh, I took sum of four line bundles over a curve and I split them arbitrarily in two plus two, <clears throat> and I'd like and I'd like the result to be independent of how I made that splitting. But so in fact, but in fact, this is this this independence in particular. What does it imply? It implies that, of course, what I can in my original geometry, I have four transfer direction. I can I can reorder them arbitrarily. So in particular, I can just change third and fourth direction. That that replaces z with z inverse. As that my index has to have that has to have that invariance. 
but also and also uh, it's like a flop invariance under for the Hilbert scheme but maybe more importantly I can change take the pair one and two and swap it with 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 uh, three and four and then what should be should be the case that I should be able to this is exactly the swap of the variable in this three-dimensional mirror symmetry so it should be the case that the Hilbert scheme of the Hilbert scheme of endpoints in C2 is self-mirror with this with this transformation with the transformation that changes that changes the the, the degree counting variable z with the with, with the variable in the maximal uh, symplectic tors. Okay that's uh that's maybe that is that is uh, maybe that like I said this is maybe archetypal uh motivating example for me and of course beyond uh, so what is what are the examples of this mirror pairs one example we've seen here another example is I saw I told you about the nilpotent cones in um, in Lie algebras and there is just Langlands duality and so uh, many many more pairs have been proposed and systematized using in particular there is a um, using a particular the power of the theory developed by uh, by Brother Mar Finkelberg and Nakajima and now um looks like I'm not gonna go to any get to any theorems today, but maybe I'll ask some uh three semi-rhetorical questions, and this would be the end of this. Yeah, maybe maybe it's too uh maybe that will be too uh too late to start to start the new topics today. Uh so it's it is a it is a challenging conjecture and this uh, is no uh no denying it's not not an easy conjecture and then uh when one is planning to do something about a challenging conjecture there's some rhetorical questions that one can ask and uh you know first is exactly where is it where is what is supposed to um how is one supposed to think about it because it's it's yeah it's some it's some statement about you know some modular all curves and some all curves or even modular of curves and and then uh, some you know, complicated stuff. Then, uh, then the second question is how do one, what does one prove it? And the third question, of course, if we suppose one prove it, proves it, then how does one use it? Like, what would be the uses of this statement like this? Or even, or even before one proves the general statement, how does one use? How can one use even the even partial results to that, to that, to that, to that uh, towards this conjecture? And uh, for both one and two, it's very useful to to break uh, the question into simpler pieces. So it, it's general strategy we use in mathematics all the time is that uh, instead of uh, trying to trying to uh, trying to think about <laughs> trying to think about uh, uh, some something very very you know all possible cases and all possible geometries, just think about uh, just think about the um, some simplest geometries and maybe be able to do something in the simplest geometries and then bootstrap this to general ones and uh what we will start to tomorrow we'll start with precisely this this program so we will think about the simplest possible geometry and what can be namely the simplest possible curve c and so what's the maybe Maybe I'll just show you the picture. What is the simplest possible curve C? Well, the simplest possible curve C is, of course, I think, is the flat space, the flat two-dimensional space. It's a general, general, general principle in physics. I think that before considering the theory on some manifold, study it in flat space. And if you understand the theory in flat space well enough, then you to, to boot to to use it to study it in general manifolds. And, and this would be similar to the study, very similar. So it, it, it's funny if I, you know, well, I try to describe something two-dimensional by references to four-dimensional, but maybe it's it's it, it will be similar to like Nekrasov's function with four dimensions. So where you study, we study, we study something in a flat space equivalent with respect to well, in principle, you can take all the morphisms, but there's maximal. You know, might as well take a maximal torus and diffeomorphism just rotates the, the space and so then similarly here we will study we will study flat space 
but we will take into account the automorphisms, which just uh, just the action of C star on, on C. Uh, and will be so that will be the subject for us to study to discuss tomorrow. Uh, but uh, for today, I think this is this is my time for today, and this is where we stop. So. No, then okay. Let's thank the professor Okungu for again. Thank you, and let's uh, let's see you all uh, tomorrow uh, four o'clock in uh, Korean time. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you very very much for your nice talk. Thank you. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow.